So uh, today we are very happy to have two speakers to present their researchers in high energy uh, seminar. Our first speaker is, uh, is uh, Dr. Rene uh, Ladlan. So uh, Rene is a H, uh, NHFP Einstein's fellow at Caltech. She did her undergraduate studies at Wayne State University in Detroit, followed by her uh, PhD work at the University of uh, Michigan in Ann Arbor. Ann Arbor. Her dissertation work involves uh, characterizing the properties of neutron star low mass X-ray binaries through spectroscopy techniques and was awarded the 2021 AS High Dissertation Prize. Her title today is the radius constraint from a nicer new star observation of the NS uh, low mass X-ray binaries uh, Cygnus X2. So uh, Renee, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about my most recent work that was accepted for publication in the Astrophysical Journal and is now posted on archive at the DOI that's listed below. And I'm going to be talking about radius constraints that were obtained from NICER and new star observations for this neutron star low mass X-ray binary system known as Cygnus X2. Now, for anyone who may not be familiar, a low mass X-ray binary just refers to a compact object in a binary system with a stellar companion that's roughly the size of our sun. And matter is stripped from that stellar companion via Roche slope overflow to form an accretion disk around the compact object. In particular here, I'm gonna be focusing on neutron star systems. And why is it important that we study neutron stars? The matter inside of a neutron star exists in an ultra dense cold state that we are unable to reproduce in Earth-based laboratories. As a result, the only way to know how matter behaves under these sets of conditions is through observations of neutron stars. Here is showing just a very, very simple cross-section schematic of a neutron star where the outermost 10 to 20% is the crust region. And in this region, the density is less than that in an atomic nucleus, or so three times 10 to the 14 grams per cubic centimeter. And we have a pretty good understanding of the structure and how the matter is behaving in the crust. But once we enter the core of the neutron star, where the density exceeds that of an atomic nucleus, this is where our understanding of the physical composition really breaks down. We don't know if we have some uniform matter of nucleons within this region or if we have generated some kind of exotic matter, such as hyperions or kaon condensates within this region, or if the nucleonic matter has broken down into its quark constituents and we have some kind of strange quark matter within this region, or even a combination. The only way to determine what the internal composition of a neutron star is, is by determining how the pressure relates to the density within the central most region, or also known as determining the equation of state of the matter. And this in turn sets the macroscopic qualities like the mass and the radius of the neutron star. So by observationally determining neutron star masses and radii, we can backtrack the equation of state and the internal composition. Here's just showing the mass radius plane for neutron stars with some different theoretical equation of states traced out based on the assumed internal composition. So blue is showing nucleonic matter, Green is showing a combination of nucleons and exotic matter, and purple is showing strange quark matter. In this top left region that is shown in gray, this is where causality is violated, where your speed of sound exceeds the speed of light within the neutron star itself, and therefore your neutron star is unstable to perturbation, so we exclude this region. And I should also mention that the equation of state tracks shown here are not comprehensive of all proposed equations of state, but is meant to demonstrate how the internal composition behaves on the mass radius plane based on the assumed composition. So we have a number of neutron star mass measurements that are from binary neutron star systems, and these agree with most of the proposed equations of state. But it's not until we get to the most massive neutron stars that have been measured to date, such as millisecond pulsar J0740, that we begin to exclude equations that cannot produce a stable neutron star above two solar masses. But there are still a number of equations that agree with the more massive neutron star measurements. So it becomes clear that we need to focus on radius constraints of neutron stars 
because the radius is a slow varying function over a large range of mass for most of the remaining equations. So one way that I have been doing this in my career is by studying disk reflection in the accretion disks around these neutron stars in low mass X-ray binary systems. This is because the accretion disk has to truncate at the surface of the neutron star, if not prior to it. And even if the neutron star happens to be smaller than the last stable circular orbit in the accretion disk, we're still able to get an angle at the equation of state by ruling out equations that may predict a more massive radius than what we infer from the disk reflection studies. Additionally, we can learn properties of the disk itself, like the density, the chemical composition, and the ionization state of the material. But we can also learn more about the neutron star, such as its magnetic field strength, or looking at any kind of boundary layers that may exist between the inner edge of the accretion disk and the neutron star surface. So just to go over the basic geometry of X-ray reflection, it's similar for black hole systems where you have your accreting compact object with a geometrically thin, optically thick accretion disk surrounding it, and then some hot electrons that form the corona that produce hard X-ray emission. So we see direct emission from the corona as well as the thermal component from the accretion disk. But some of these hard X-rays can irradiate the disk, be reprocessed and re-emitted in what is known as the reflection spectrum. So here's just showing the overall spectrum that's observed. So you have your thermal disk component, those hard X-rays from the corona, and then the reprocessed emission with this prominent feature near six to seven keV, which is due to iron emission. But in these systems, we can also have that the neutron star or a boundary layer that exists between the surface of the neutron star and the inner edges of the disk can emit in the form of a thermal component as well. And this can be reprocessed and re-emitted, giving an overall different spectral shape shown here. But we still have this reprocessed emission with this prominent feature between six to seven keV due to iron. Now the iron line is important because it is an intrinsically narrow emission line that is drawn due to different effects within the innermost accretion disk. So from standard Keplerian motion, you get your two horn profile. Then due to the rapid rate at which the material is moving in the inner disk, you get that some of this is beamed into and out of our line of sight, giving the overall skewed shape. Then because the matter is sitting in this large gravitational potential well close to the compact object, this is overall gravitationally redshifted down to lower energies, which is shown here. So each of these are coming into play to shape the overall line profile we observe. So the degree of broadening in the red wing or how extended this line emission is to low energies tells us how close we are to the compact object. But we can also learn about the inclination of the system from looking at the blue wing. This is because as you look at a system more face on, you're not gonna have a lot of that Doppler shifted emission and therefore you have a steep drop in your iron line profile. But as you start to increase your inclination, you're going to broaden this out to higher energies. So the source that I'm specifically talking about here, again, is Cygnus X2. This is a persistently accreting Z source. And this just refers to the characteristic shape that's traced out on a hard color X-ray color versus soft X-ray color diagram shown here. As the system transitions from a hard spectral state in the horizontal branch to a softer spectral state in the normal branch, the softest in the flaring. But these systems are also characterized sometimes by their shape on the hardness intensity diagram. And in this case, Cygnus X2 traces out a backward C shape from the horizontal branch down to the flaring. The system has a binary orbital period that's measured at 9.8 days with an inclination of about 63 degrees. And from this optically determined mass estimate of the neutron star was determined to be 1.71 plus or minus 0 0.21 solar masses. So this is why it's a good candidate for getting radius constraints because there's already an existing mass estimate for the system. Now, I'm sure people are familiar with these different observatories, but just to recap, the two missions are New Star, which is the nuclear spectroscopic telescope array that has this large 10 meter deployable mass to focus in hard X-rays from three to 79 keV. And then additionally, observations were taken with NICER, which has a softer energy passband and is installed on the International Space Station. And it stands for the Neutron Star Interior Competition Explorer. And it has a soft passband from about 0.2 to 10 keV. So by combining these missions, we get a broad X-ray passband to observe this source, 
as well as more photons in the iron band region in order to get those radius constraints. So New Star observed the source on three separate occasions, once in 2015 and two times in 2019. And you can see when looking at the hardness intensity diagram, we do see that backward C shape from the horizontal branch down to the flaring branch, although there was a change in the overall intensity between these two observing epochs. And you can see the source is very variable in each of these observations as they transition from the normal branch to a flaring branch to the horizontal branch and the vertex between the horizontal and normal branch. NICER observed the source simultaneously with New Star in the 2019 observations, so observation two and three. And here is just showing the NICER and New Star energy coverage during these observing times, and there's pretty good overlap between the two missions. The solid markers are indicating New Star's hard X ray passband from three to 30 keV. And NICER is shown in the half opened markers from the softer energy band of 0.5 to 6.8 keV. So even though there's good overlap between these two missions during the observing time, you can see that the behavior in the different missions varies. And this just happens to be because one's a hard X-ray mission, the other one being a soft X-ray mission. Now, when selecting our data for doing the inner disk radius constraints, we really wanted to get a robust estimate. So when breaking up the data in the observations, we only selected different branches within observations that had a cumulative count rate of over 10 million or over a million counts per spectrum. So this left us with the normal branch from observation one, the vertex between the horizontal and normal branch in observation two, and the horizontal branch in observation three. And here is showing the new star and nicer new star iron line profiles for each of these different observations and branches. Now, when spectral modeling, we used two independent continuum models to start with modeling the data. We used the three component phenomenological model of an accretion disk, a single temperature black body that's either coming from the neutron star surface or that boundary layer region, and a power law component. And conversely, we used a more physical model, which is just an accretion disk and then thermal Comptonization from a single temperature black body. From this, we add independent reflection models to kind of test the constraints we get on our inner disk radius. And this is also consistently modeling the reflection with what the continuum is describing. So first we use the Relzil NS model, which is a new fully self-consistent reflection model that is generated from the single temperature black body component. And then we use the approximation of RFX conf to convolve the Comptonization component and create a relativistically blurred reflection component from the Comptonization component. And that's blurred again with RD blur. From this, we see that there's still this one KEV feature that's present in the spectrum that is not accounted for by the reflection modeling. So this is either coming from perhaps a collisionally ionized plasma farther out or a photo ionized plasma farther out. But regardless of how we actually model this component, whether we use a single Gaussian line or a collisionally ionized plasma itself, the results that we get agree within the 90% confidence level of, from each other. So for one case, we get an upper limit of seven gravitational radii. In the other case, we get a little bit higher of a limit of an 8.5 gravitational radii, and as well as the inclination agreeing with the optical estimates. So regardless of our various spectral modeling choices, the accretion disk remains close to the neutron star in each branch and over these variations in intensity. So that's encouraging. Now, what does this mean for the constraints on the mass radius plane? I mentioned that we got constraints in terms of gravitational radii, which is corresponds to the gravitational constant, the mass of the neutron star over the speed of light squared. And because the system has a mass measurement for the neutron star, we're able to convert this into a physical unit. So this is the region that is traced out on the mass radius plane from disk reflection modeling. And this gives an upper limit of 19.5 kilometers for the high mass end and 15.3 kilometers for the low mass end. And we can compare this to other current state of the art methods. 
such as pulsar light curve modeling mapping with NICER, which is looking at these modulations from the surface of the neutron star as hotspots rotate into and out of our line of sight. And this gives compactness measurements. So here is that most massive neutron star pulsar J0740. From the two different independent teams, so you have the Illinois Maryland is shown in the maroon and in orange is shown showing the Amsterdam group. Here are the constraints from the first pulsar that was mapped with NICER, which is pulsar J0030 from, again, the two separate teams. And then the constraints that are obtained from gravitational wave merger events of 1708-17 and 1904-25. So while disk reflection studies are not able to rule out a single equation on its own, it can provide an independent check of constraints on the mass radius plane when taken in comparison to these other state-of-the-art methods and it can help with ultimately narrowing down the allowed region for the equation of state on the mass radius plane. But we also have another way of kind of getting radius constraints in this system. So in addition to just looking at the disk reflection components and modeling the different uh, broadening effects within the innermost accretion disk, we get some kind of estimate of radial extents from other components. So from the inner or from the modeling the accretion disk component itself, we get a limit of where the inner disk radius is, is 15 to 62 kilometers. Now this is very large, but this is driven by the uncertainty in the distance to the source. So because the distance of the source is so uncertain, it could be anywhere from about six to 12 kiloparsecs. This therefore is shown within the uncertainties of estimating the emission radii from other spectral components. We can also estimate the emission radius from the black body, that single temperature black body component. And if we assume it's spherical emission, we get a radius anywhere from four to eight kilometers. But that is way too small to be coming from the surface of the neutron star. And instead suggests that this is actually coming from a more narrow banded emission component that is consistent with coming from a boundary layer region. And if we assume this narrow banded emission component has a height that's about 10% of the radial extent, we get a more physically plausible estimate of 13 to 27 kilometers. We can also estimate the, ra estimate the radial extent of the boundary layer component from the surface of the neutron star itself without knowing the radial extent of the neutron star just from this equation that was given in Papa and Sunyaev in 2001. And this is based upon the mass accretion rate of the system alone. So this gives quite a large region as well of anywhere from 11 to 91 kilometers. Now this is extremely large, but the reasoning for this is that this is a 1D approximation and does have those uncertainties from the distance to the source. And because it's not accounting for any kind of spread in the vertical direction, if it were allowing for a spread in the vertical direction, it likely would shrink down to something that's more consistent with what we're seeing from these other estimates. But just to remind you that the constraints that we obtain from the inner disk reflection modeling is an upper limit of 19.5 kilometers for the high mass end. We can see that all of these are kind of working together to build a picture of what the accretion looks like in these systems. But there is the advantage of using disk reflection studies to bypass the uncertainties within disk, the distance to the source itself. So just to summarize, based on this study and other studies, that regardless of the various spectral modeling choices that we used here, the accretion disk remains close to the neutron star in each of the different branches during these NICER and new star observations. And additionally, the upper limit on the radius of the neutron star via disk reflection studies can provide an independent check of the constraints on the mass radius plane when taken in comparison to other state-of-the-art methods. So thank you for your attention. I will take any questions. And I also have my email in case anybody wants to ask me further questions after they have digested this further. Thank you very much, Renee. Very nice talk, thank you. Uh, uh, please raise your hand if you have any questions. So Dan, please. 
Yeah, I'm just looking at the uh, distance between some of these different models, which are very small, and and you know the errors in the state of the art today. So, you know, what are the real prospects of of selecting, especially between the various conventional models, which seem to, which presently seem allowed. Yes. Uh, sorry so, if that's an ignorant question. No, it's it's a good question. So I believe you're asking what are the prospects for actually narrowing down the equation of state based upon what's kind of allowed right now with these larger errors. Is that correct? Well, I'm lo I'm looking at the slide that's showing and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, for a couple of these different blue lines, you need to measure the radius to maybe 0.01 kilometer. So what's right. the prospect for doing that? Uh, yes. So the nicer mission right now is trying to get these constraints at the 5% level. And that's something that is going to improve as the mission extends its baseline and obtains more and more photons to reach that limit of getting down to the 5% level. In the original case, this is still at the 8% level. This one, you can see there's more uncertainty between these two different independent teams, but they're kind of, they're converging at the 68% confidence level to what's more reasonable, right? But I think that in order to get even tighter constraints in the future, it's a limit of photons or really like signal to noise limited. And I think that's where the next generation of missions are trying to make progress, but we're still 10 plus years away from getting down to the most stringent constraints that we can obtain. I think that's, that's the issue. So there's like the Strobex mission that wants to become a super nicer, have higher effective collecting area, able to obtain more signal to noise in a short amount of time to really drive tighter constraints on these kind of methodologies. We need more observations of binary neutron star mergers as, as well. Right now we only have one, one and a half because that other source 190525 is, there's a little uncertainty if that was neutron star, neutron star or a neutron star black hole. So I think that's going to improve with the upgrades to LIGO as well. And with the improvements in like Athena coming online, we can also have that larger effective collecting area to do better reflection spectroscopy and really drive down the upper limit on neutron star radii as well. So I think we're just limited by the capabilities and signal to noise right now. Thank you. Uh, is there any other questions? A uh, quick question here, Josh Grindley. Um, you mentioned there was, a, you know, the distance uncertainty for SIGX2. Why is that? It's a nice, bright optical counterpart. Why isn't there a, a, a Gaia measurement, which I haven't looked up to see, but it must be there. Yes. Um, so you are correct. There's a lot of uncertainty in the reported distances based on if you're using type 1 X-ray bursts. Um, you mentioned Gaia, and there was a Gaia early data release estimate that was done in conjunction with taking information from burst, and that put it as a at far away, more like 11 kiloparsecs, so at the upper end. Uh, I am hoping that with the actual Gaia data release three, mm -hmm. that will become more certain, but. Okay, yeah. So uh, maybe I can ask a, a quick question. So what's your future uh, stat for the project? Yes. So what I, my future direction and what I'm kind of heading towards is trying to, one thing I want to do with this, with that multiple emission features that we saw that 1KV feature is trying to learn more about the accretion geometry in these systems by determining where these multiple features are coming from. However, that one wasn't actually coming from reflection, so we couldn't do tests to learn more about the accretion geometry in the inner disk that was coming from somewhere farther out in the system itself. 
So I've been focusing on looking at ultra compact X-ray binaries where the companion is a white dwarf cis companion and therefore the chemical composition differs and you have a low energy oxygen line in conjunction with an iron component and in order to kind of map out the accretion flow in those systems. So that's kind of where I'm going. Thank you very much. And I think uh, we can go to, uh, we can go ahead to the next speaker. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is our friend at CFA. So uh, Rafael, please, uh, uh, if well, you are ready. So Yes, uh, oops, I almost left the meeting. Sorry, I am going to share my screen now. Uh, and so uh, Rafael is a, uh, an uh, astrophysicist at the uh, at CFA, where he serves as the deputy end-to-end -end scientist for the Chandra X-ray Center data systems. His research focuses on multi-wavelength studies of star-forming galaxies, as well as on the use of machine learning techniques for the explanation of large astronomical uh, data sets, especially. especially uh, with the aim of finding astrophysical transients such as uh, actually binaries or tidal disruption events. Before joining the CXC, he was a postdoc fellow at, the, at, CF, uh, at CFA and a teaching fellow at Harvard University's Institute for Applied Computational Science, where he taught uh, stochastic optimization and uh, machine learning. He, was, uh, he has worked as a calibration scientist for the mid-infrared instrument for the JWST and is currently a member of the LSST science collaboration in the transits and the variable stars. He holds a PhD in the astronomy from the Leiden University in the Netherlands. And his title today is Data Science as a Tool for Discovery in X-ray Data Sites, the case of uh, Chandra Source Catalog. So Rafael, the floor is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Yeah, thanks for a nice uh, introduction. And thank you, Rene, also for a very nice talk. Uh, so I was, I was afraid because of the uh, transition to kind of in-person activities, you were gonna force me to speak in person and I need a, a additional social training for that still. So I'm happy this is still happening online. Anyway, uh, uh, I'm gonna take you a little bit away hopefully not too much from the physics and I'm going to try to bring you a little bit closer to a data perspective on high energy data uh, and so that's that's what explains the title of this talk uh, data science as a tool for discovery and x-ray data sets and what I'm showing down here is just the beautiful Chandra telescope uh, a little bit of a representation of the collision between uh, neutron stars and a little scheme there that shows one of the types of models that I like you to that I like to introduce you today that you can use to uh, analyze X-ray data. So I'm going to be taking very few uh, credit for very little credit from what I'm about to talk uh, uh, today. I uh, this is this is mostly work that I've been doing in uh, collaboration with a few students that have been brave enough to try to explore these ideas with me, uh, as well as uh, a few other collaborators uh, here at the C CFA and elsewhere. And so you can uh, praise them for the good things and, and blame me for, for the bad things that I'm about to say. Uh, and I think the main, the main thing really, the main, one of the main messages I want to convey to you today is that X-ray astronomy is now also, and is quickly turning into, you know, being data science as well. Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the recent uh, launch of Erosita for example, has uh, started to provide us with data volumes that are big enough and complex enough to treat some of the problems that we want to try to solve as data science problems, as well as astrophysics problems. So for example, the, this is the first uh, kind of scan of the sky with Erosita. Uh, Erosita is uh, giving a data volume of about 60, 600 megabytes per day. If you extend that over a period of seven years, that's about 1.5 terabytes of data. Uh, it has a time domain aspect, uh, about a thousand square degrees of the sky uh, near the poles, the galactic poles here will be observed and visited by the Erosita observations more than 30 times uh, over the first four years of the mission. And only this first scan is 165 gigabytes of raw data. 
uh, and mostly transform into event files, but that doesn't uh, even contain yet all the side products such as catalogs, et cetera, et cetera, likers, spectra that actually come from the raw data. So we are quickly transforming uh, high energy astrophysics data sets into complex and uh, very big beasts that we need to think about in different ways in order to, to analyze. And even before we go to the Erosita era, we already have existing data sets that are complex enough and big enough that perhaps invite us to use these kind of methods of data science. And one of them is the Chandra source catalog that has been produced by ourselves here at the, at, at the Chandra X-ray Center. And the Chandra source catalog uh, is the ultimate repository of Chandra data. Every single source that Chandra has detected uh, serendipitous or not over the last 20 something years will be part of this catalog uh, after the final release uh, and that covers uh, of course uh, a lot of different observations that have been stacked etc etc uh, and uh, this spring we will start with the processing of the next version that will take that will include observations after 2014. Uh, but, you know, one important thing is that this catalog, uh, probably unknown to some of you, uh, is not only a, a list of properties, but it also has a bunch of additional data uh, products uh, that make a lot of volume. Uh, in fact, 2.1 will be about 22 terabytes in size. And those additional data products include things like spectra, spectral fits to, to the detections and the sources we have in the catalog, light curves, uh, background maps, etc, etc. So it's a very rich and complex data sets, perhaps one of the most complex data sets in, uh, in X-ray uh, in high energy astrophysics, and therefore it kind of invites us to use new ways to, to analyze it. And those new ways, uh, in some sense, all have to do with data science. And, and data science is one of those things that is very hard to define. And I think this, this visualization by Hugh Conway is, is a good way to try to summarize it. It's kind of the mixture of, of a bunch of things, math and statistics and some hacking skill, hacking skills, uh, but below all that, of course, substan substantive uh, expertise, domain knowledge, which I think is very important. Uh, you can think of data science as something involving machine learning, which are basically complex nonlinear functions that map certain input features into some quantities that we want to be able to predict or to know uh, better. Uh, you can think of things like visualization. How do I take all these huge data sets and visualize them in new ways that allow me to make discovery uh, a little bit more easy? Uh, hacking is an important part of this, uh, you know, in the sense of we need to start thinking about effective formats to deliver uh, not only the data, but also the data products and the pipelines that we use to produce those uh, data products. And I'm thinking in terms of cloud computing, uh, Jupyter notebooks, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and of course, below that, uh, because there's a there's a trend to use machine learning for, for pretty much anything uh, uh, without really thinking about it. Uh, I think one important aspect is domain knowledge. So you need to make sure that you understand what's going on, uh, whether these methods really make sense to you or not. But in general, I think we can think together of new ways to think about how X-ray data, data sets are visualized and analyzed. Here are some of the potential applications that I see, and, and of course, uh, there's, there's, there's lots more. But among the things that we can do uh, with data science and X-ray data are things such as source classification. You know, most of the source in X-ray catalogs, including the Chandra source catalog, uh, are lacking a label. We don't know what they are. And of course, labeling, labeling them is a, is a very good first step to start understanding them. So classification of sources is one of the things you can do. Uh, there's also time domain studies. Uh, we were just uh, hearing from Rene about all these uh, very compact objects that can lead to certain transitions of states or collisions that produce gravitational wave events, etc., etc. That produces uh, transients that we want to be able to identify uh, identify efficiently in in large X-ray uh, data sets. Uh, anomaly uh, identification, serendipity plays an important role in discovery. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and one question uh, we want to ask is, can we uh, make that serendipity a little bit more systematic, you know, by finding things like this really nice uh, 
kind of uh, periodic, quasi-periodic tidal disruption event that was detected a few years back uh, uh, serendipitously, can we make those kind of discoveries a little bit more systematic? Uh, and also stat statistical learning of X-ray properties. We have uh, very complex algorithms that estimate properties of X-rays, uh, X-ray sources, such as you know variabilities and hardness ratios and spectral properties. Uh, and maybe these uh, these pipelines can be uh, computationally expensive. Can we find a way to take a data-driven approach to estimating? these properties in new in new sources and new detections. So I am, of course, uh, or we are, of course, not the first ones who have been thinking about these things. And there's been a lot of previous research on how data science and statistics and machine learning can be used to uh, explore these things. And I'm just showing you a few examples here if you're interested. Uh, there was actually last summer a very interesting uh, workshop organized here on, on data science with, uh, with Chandra. And you can check out uh, the list of talks that we're giving, uh, there's also recordings if, in case you're interested. So there's, there's lots of ideas. So this is, this is really kind of new, but not that new. Uh, so I'm going to show you a couple of examples of the things we've been doing. Uh, and the first thing I want to show you is about classification of X-ray sources. This is some, some work that has been led by Samuel Perez, who's a student back in, in Bogota, Colombia, who's uh, likely to be coming to visit us soon to, to work on this project. Uh, and uh, here's the thing, there, there's a lot of sources that don't have a label uh, and it's important, as I was saying before, to assign labels to those sources to know if they are, for example, the kind of nice X-ray binaries uh, that Rene was telling us about before or some other thing or some other uh, kind of object. But uh, classification of, uh, of X-ray sources can be very challenging. Uh, because many of these uh, sources might not have, for example, optical counterparts to try to spectrally classify them. Also, the existing list of X-ray sources that have been independently classified is very small. So a lot of the efforts that have been uh, done to do classification using supervised machine learning methods uh, suffer from the fact that our training sets are not very representative of what we want to classify. For example, this is a very nice uh, work by uh, Young et al. at George Washington University, where tra they try to come up with a bunch of multi-wavelength uh, diagnostics to try to classify. But one problem you see, for example, is that some kind of sources are way more represented than other sources, and that biases your training set and that biases your results when you use a supervised method of machine learning. Uh, you know, classifiers can also be very specific. For example, they are not very, uh, you know, they don't cover uh, all types of classes. So, so for example, they can be spe specialized on uh, distinguishing between neutron star stars and black holes. And even in that, in those binary cases, uh, the classification accuracy will strongly depend on things like the signal to noise ratio, which is not very surprising, as you see in the histograms here. And even in the in the stage, in the evolutionary stage of these objects, so as you see here, those uh, intensity harness ratios that uh, Rene was also showing, and you see that your success at classifying an object as a black hole or as a neutron star depends on where along its kind of uh, phase of evolution this object is. So it would be ideally nice to have some sort of uh, probabilistic classification uh, of objects. And that's exactly what we're trying to do uh, by using unsupervised method methods instead. So uh, basically, just to say it quickly, what we're trying to do is group objects, as you can see here, uh, using X-ray properties for, from the Chandra source catalog or other catalogs and group them without necessarily labeling uh, in, the, in the initial step and maximize some sort of likelihood that those properties are kind of com a, a combination, a mixture of, of Gaussian distributions. And by doing that, we depend less on training sets, we depend less on the fact that we need a lot of objects to be already classified. Uh, and uh, it, it, of course, gives us uh, the opportunity to at least separate objects into different properties to try to assign a class. So what does what we do? We use a Gaussian mixture model with the CSC properties, and we try to do a classification of objects based on that. Though that kind of clustering uh, approach, what it does, it, it successfully separates uh, distinct observational properties from different objects. For example, it creates clusters 
of, for example, very hard objects that are not variable and clusters of very soft objects that are variable, for example. And you can see that you still don't know what they are, but at least you're kind of trying to separate those objects with that. And then within each cluster, we evaluate probability of membership to specific classes and assign probabilistic classification. And the way in which we do that is uh, by using, uh, well, surprise, surprise, also some, some data science. So we, uh, within a given cluster, as you see here to the right, you have a bunch of objects. Some of them, uh, perhaps a minority of them, will have some labels. Uh, and perhaps different types of label, even though they belong to the same cluster, for example, young stars of different types. And then you'll have a number of objects that do not have, do not have uh, classes, but have, have been assigned to that uh, particular cluster. So what you can do is you try to measure the distance of each object to each of different little, to the, to the centroids of, of those different uh, groups that actually have labels and use the distance as a measure of the probability of that object belonging to that particular class. And we use this particular metric, the Mahalanobis distance, because there are some uh, correlation between the properties in X-ray data sets. So you want to take into account that, but that's basically what we're doing that. And when we do that, we are able to actually create uh, classification, uh, probabilistic classification of objects. So we provide some sort of posterior distribution of the probability of the object belonging to different class uh, based on, on the X-ray properties alone. So we have done that uh, for a number of X-ray sources and X-ray detections in the, uh, in the Chandrasos catalog and came up with a catalog of probabilistic classification for these objects. Uh, that for the moment includes only X-ray information because as I was saying before, uh, we, ha we can have very little information from the optical counterparts, et cetera, et cetera. But you can even add optical information to update those probabilistic catalogs and get, get back uh, some refined classification of these objects. And of course, in order to validate here, we look at again, kind of bona fide uh, objects, objects of which we're pretty sure of their class and look at whether or not they agree with what we expect. This is, for example, 3C84, a radio galaxy in Perseus, uh, where actually our classification scheme assigns the highest probability for it being a cipher 2, which agrees with what we mostly know of, of this object. So this is how we validate this classification. So this is a first thing that, that, that I wanted to show you as to what kind of things you can do with data science and X-ray data. One other thing uh, that is quite relevant, and this is work that has been uh, led by Amanda Chavez, who's transitioning into grad school right now, and who was a summer student here at CFA uh, is a time domain aspect. So one of the things that the Chandrasos catalog gives is likers uh, of, uh, of uh, pretty much uh, all uh, detections of X-ray sources that have enough counts. So we build like curves of uh, Chandra detections using uh, the Gregory Loredo algorithm. Uh, which I'm happy to talk to you about uh, on a different time. It's, it's an interesting algorithm to try to build these likers, but we provide them as part of the catalog. And, you know, surprisingly, people don't use them much. And, and, and I'm always surprised as to why that is. Uh, but, but they contain a lot of information. And one of the things you can do with them is you can try to uh, find transients or transit-like X-ray curves. And you can do things very simple, very simple things in order to do that. So for example, one of the things we've done is we've taken uh, this quantity that is kind of a, a ratio between the, the average uh, value between the maximum count rate of the light curve and the minimum count rate and the actual mean of the entire light curve to try to figure out whether there's spikes uh, or dips in, in, in these light curves. And if you plot those quantities, uh, to get, uh, you know, and you plot it against uh, the sigma, which is kind of the dispersion of the light curve and color code by variability probability as estimated using the Gregory Loretta algorithm. This is what you see. So you'll see objects that seem to have a large uh, value of the uh, MM average value, which indicates they could be some sort of transients. And then in particular objects that lie below the one line, the, the M, MM average equals one line, are objects that are likely to be uh, transients. And you see them here uh, color coded again by variability probability. And those are objects that we are investigating to be perhaps transits. One kind of tr what kind of transits? Well, that, that object that you see marked there is precisely uh, this object that was reported uh, by uh, Rosandi Stefano and collaborators last year that they've uh, argued 
uh, it's a candidate for an exoplanet crossing in front of a star and that really nicely pops up as one of the objects that has one of those low numbers of uh, you know, using these quantities. We've done something additional. We've passed this through an anomaly detection algorithm, including also the spectral properties, and we've created a, a, a list of several hundred objects that are likely to be uh, transits on transients and that are also peculiar in, the, in their spectral properties. So, for example, they are very soft or they are very hard, apart from being uh, transient in nature. Uh, one of these objects, for example, just to give you a taste of it, is this, this object. Uh, this is a light curve that shows some sort of transient-like behavior, which happens to be actually significant enough to create, uh, uh, to, 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 to return a very high probability of variability. And in fact, modeling of this light curve indicates that pure Poisson noise would be unlikely to create this transient. So this is, this is likely to be true. Uh, this object uh, is bed fitted with uh, a, a some sort of apex apex spectral model at a temperature of 0.2 kilo electron volts. And something that is interesting about this object is that it has an optical counterpart that happens to be a white dwarf. So we're currently investigating what this object could be. Uh, uh, there is no evidence for a um, for change in the hardness ratios during the light curve, even though there's not a lot of counts, but there's no indication of that, which kind of disfavors this being some sort of flare. So we're investigating a number of scenarios, including perhaps a lensing event. Uh, and then finally, the third kind of little idea that I wanted to share with you has to do with uh, statistical learning uh, from individual events. And this is this is a, an interesting project on which uh, Lucas Mackinnon, who's currently a PhD student at Imperial College in London, has been working on. And the idea here really is all we have in X-ray data sets is mostly event lists. And we have that as part of the Chandra uh, data sets, but we also have that as part of the Erosita data sets, the XMN data sets, they are basically events. So it wouldn't be nice if instead of waiting uh, until either the scientist who got the observation or uh, the, the Chandra source catalog falls, uh, produce the next version, uh, that's, that's us by the way, so you can't blame me for that, produce the next version of the catalog, wouldn't it be nice if you uh, actually have a new detection with a bunch of event lists, you, you, you nicely select your detection around it, and using the information in the events directly could quickly uh, know the properties of this source, for example, is this source variable? Does this source have a, a, a big hardness ratio between the hard and the soft band, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So we're trying to achieve that by using information from the Chandra source catalog, and for that we are using a some sort of neural network approach. Uh, the advantage here, of course, is that we have we do have in this case a very robust training set, which is the Chandra source catalog itself. So we have the true labels for the things we'd like to estimate, for example, the, uh, the uh, variability probabilities or the harness ratios or the values of the spectral, fits, uh, parameter, spectral fit parameters very carefully estimated as part of the channel source catalog with, uh, with algorithms that are robust but that can be heavy in, in terms of the computing. Uh, and we have you know, at least 15 years of, of that for the moment on which we could train an algorithm. So we've done that and we've uh, taken event files, you know, uh, we've uh, taken cut, cut, cuts, really little cutouts of those uh, event files around specific uh, uh, regions that contain detections. And we've trained an algorithm using this deep set architecture that is basically a neural network uh, layer that does not care about the order of the events. A lot of the properties uh, in X-ray capsules, for example, the harness ratios are permutation invariant. We don't care as to when in time these events arrived. We just care about the distribution. So you can use layers, uh, neural network layers that uh, don't care about permutations in the same way as you have convolutional neural networks that don't care about rotations or translations when you analyze images. And we can use that scheme to try to predict what these quantities are. And this is relevant. I think this is relevant for several reasons, of course, uh, because it uh, allows you to take your data. If you, if you have a tool that does that based on previous training, you could take just your, 
your data sets and uh, try to estimate properties with certain uh, accuracy uh, of those quantities. Also, I think in terms of detecting transients, for example, if we were, if we were able to single out transients uh, by doing this kind of exercise, it would be great to have that as an automatic detection of sources before we have to wait uh, until, for example, the the uh, the the the, the the Chandrasas catalog folks do the processing of those sources. We should be able to, to detect transients on the fly, and that could be a good way to do that. Uh, so does this actually work? Well, it, 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 it Sorry, seems Rafael, to be... Yes, two minutes left. Yes, yes, I'm almost done. Uh, so is, is, it, uh, is it working? Uh, it turns out, yes, well, to some extent. This, what well, you see here, is a, uh, a loss function of the algorithm trying to learn variability uh, uh, probabilities from the Chandra source catalog and what you see below is a distribution of harness ratios that have been predicted uh, using only one epoch so this is uh, you know before we do this many times many passes through the data with only one pass we are able to start getting very decent predictions of what the harness ratios are just by taking the event files as an input uh, you can, you can uh, modify this to also perform some sort of anomaly detection. So you can do some sort of binary classification where you, where you plug some anomalies, for example, that transit of the exoplanet that I showed earlier, and try to see if the algorithm is able, able to identify it is, is using a similar, uh, a similar approach. And in fact, the way in which you embed the data, and you know, one big thing about this is embedding, because uh, event files have different lengths, one possible way in which you can embed the data before you pass, to, you pass them through a, a neural network is, for example, by creating these kind of histograms, DE, DT maps, where you kind of, uh, you're just basically creating a 2D histogram of the differences in times of the arrival, times of the photons and the energies and see how those objects look like. And if you see the upper left corner, that's actually the exoplanet transient that was reported by the Stefan Aro. And you can almost visually identify some of these anomalies. Uh, and, and on top of that, you can just pass this through a convolutional approach because now you have images instead of simple event files. So there's there's a lot of potential here, and I encourage uh, everyone to try to do these kind of things. This is just another way of uh, visualizing anomalies where you just plot uh, some of the properties from the Chandrasos catalog. This is color coded by the anomaly uh, the score that we assign using a random forest uh, anomaly detection algorithm. But you see that those that come up as being more anomalous uh, just you know pop up as being kind of drawn from a very different distribution with respect to the bulk of the object. So there's a lot of things that you can do just by visualizing these things in a, in a different way. Anyway, this is, this is where I want to stop. So I'm going to leave you with some take home messages. Uh, in particular, I want to say that, you know, this, all these augmented data sets that we're creating uh, from, from our data sets uh, here at, at the uh, CXC, but also elsewhere, uh, we should make every effort possible to make those available. And that means making your data sets available, uh, your products available, but also your, your pipelines available. And, and uh, we know irrespective of who's the author of that, uh, ideally, I would like to see this included in sort of some sort of repository where we bring all this data, we bring the pipeline so that everyone can reproduce and share that with the community that would be interested in that. If, you, if you're into little data science and you want to play with Chandra Source, catalog, uh, there is a couple of notebooks, Jupyter notebooks in our documentation where you can easily access uh, not only the tabulated properties of the Chandra source catalog, but also all the data products, including spectral uh, properties and Likert. So please feel free to talk to me if you're interested. And that's where I'm going to stop. Thanks. Thank you very much, Rafael. Uh, thank you very much for so, my, uh, so much information. And uh, I, uh, so if you have question to Rafael, please raise your hand. So maybe I, I ask the first one. <laughs> so Rafael, you mentioned that uh, the CSC 2.1 will be, its work is in progress. Could you introduce more about uh, what's the improvement of the, the the 2.1 than the 2.0. So yeah, so what I said is that uh, this spring we will start processing uh, the data that will make up the new version of the catalog. 
and the processing of it will uh, take for the entire thing will take about a year but we will be making data available as it's processed uh, improvements uh, include the fact that uh, we are using all the observations that were not included in 2.0 uh, 2.0 was released uh, in late 2019 and included observations all the way to 2014 we will be now including observations that came after that we've done a number of improvements on some of the algorithms to uh, uh, you know uh, make sure that the uh, positions of the sources etc etc are better are better determined we've also tied the uh, we've also tied the astrometry of every single stack of the uh, chandra source catalog to the Gaia reference frame. So that will kind of be an absolute correction of astrometry that will give you better matches and better positions uh, with Gaia sources by tying the 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 Chandra source source Chandra source catalog sources to the to the Gaia reference frame. So there's there's a number of improvements uh, that will be uh, coming up as part of the 2.1 version that you'll be able to start exploring in the spring. Thank you very much. Uh, so I saw a raised hand from Doug. Doug, please. Hi, Raphael. Um, so going back to your first section where you're talking about the um, the different categories that you're doing. So, yeah, um, it would be interesting, but very hard to do, to do a comparison of the categories you get here from with something like the XMM catalog. Just right. because that would, you know, I guess give you some identification of you know how much you believe them or not. Yeah, I mean certainly uh, we will not. Ideally, we will not be relying uh, on the Chandra Source Catalog uh, alone. In fact, uh, at this point, we are also including uh, information from optical and infrared counterparts in the analysis. Uh, yes, the XMM Newton uh, catalog includes classification for some of the sources, and some of them are actually counterparts of these sources. So it 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 be definitely a good thing to check and to validate these results. One of one of the questions we really want to answer here is how much can you know from the X-ray data alone, and how much do you improve? when you use optical information. But of course, you can also ask the question, how much do you gain by uh, combining together different sorts of X-ray uh, catalogs, which is definitely something that we could that we could attempt to do here. That's a nice suggestion. Thanks, Doc. Thank you. Uh, so I saw another raise hand. Uh, sorry, Randall, please. Uh, yes, excellent talk. And actually, to my mind, now raises the question, if you've got a sort of typical source, so say that it's reasonably close to on axis, not particularly bright, but not particularly dim. Um, is there any advantage now to going through and, and reanalyzing it or re-extracting the data yourself? Or is the source catalog going to be the most accurate that, that is, can be done and, and we should both use and tell other people to use the catalog directly? Well, I, I am a, I am a believer on the Chandra source catalog. I've I've been involved in a lot of the algorithms that have been devel developed to make this as accurate as possible, and I believe that it is uh, the best possible estimate of the properties. I've seen too many papers where people re-estimate properties uh, for sources that are already part of the Chandra source catalog, which is fine. Uh, but people should at least uh, get used to check against it because I think we've done a very careful job at, uh, you know, especially, especially those sources you're talking about, Randall, those that are on axis, you know, good number of counts, those properties are uh, very nicely uh, estimated and, 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 and they, are, they are science ready. Uh, you know, if you check the documentation that I, that link I was sharing at the end, uh, you can certainly see uh, ways to access that information. I mean, we have a number of ways in which you can access the catalog, but uh, but one of and one that you can use is, is Jupyter, Jupyter notebooks. You know, you can uh, use our our tab services to bring the tables down, the spectra down, the Likers within the same section, so, uh, within the same se session of, of your Jupyter notebook, and do all these kind of things. So I would I would encourage people to do that, uh, to to check against the catalog uh, or to just use those products because uh, we believe they are they are of very very good quality and they include things like the light curve the spectral fits and the spectra itself so so yeah so that's i hope that's that's answering your question yep thank you yeah. 
Thank you. I I see another uh, raise hand. Happy, please. Well, just a comment since we're mostly us X ray uh, people here, uh, potential users of the catalog. The catalog is very thoroughly uh, tested. Um, so, in most cases, probably you get better answers by using catalog data than doing your own analysis. So, you should get the same answers. And, uh, but it's still a work in progress. So, if you find some oddities, play, please let, let us know because. Uh, uh, you know, it could make a, a better next version of the catalog. Thanks, Pepe. Uh, thanks, Pepe. Uh, I think I didn't see any other raise hand, so I think we can call it a day. And thank you very much, uh, Rafael and uh, Rene. And uh, I think, uh, uh, and also thank you, everyone, for joining. I see you next week. Thank you all. Thanks.